Hello, hello. Thank you very much for waiting. Thank you very much for coming. Um, thanks for inviting me as well, the people who did, and for organising uh, this event here. So, the talk is going to be down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Um, this started from an article I began writing last year from this horrendously titled How Bitcoin's 2016 Block Difficulty Retarget, blah, 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 blah. Um, I started writing about that and in writing it I realised that I couldn't write about that without mentioning some other things um, such as uh, consensus and various other technical and social layers of Bitcoin and it ended up becoming a 35 minute um, terribly long, very boring article which I've actually yet to actually finish. So um, it, it, that just gave me the idea that there's so many things in Bitcoin that are interconnected and so many incentives that are connected to each other. I wanted to try and cover that um, in a talk. Um, oh, who am I? Um, I'm Matthew Hayward. Um, I'm a technical writer who um, works with Blockstream. Um, and previous to that, I've done development on um, Zero Link, which is an open source um, privacy framework um, for Bitcoin. Um, and before that, I was a developer for about 20 years. Um, so that I can pitch my talk, I've, I have asked a few people already actually what the sort of knowledge level of Bitcoin is. Um, I assumed, um, I think when I started writing, I assumed it, it was a bit higher. It's not a problem at all. So I've put a few slides in the beginning that I wrote fairly recently um, that gives an introduction to Bitcoin. So um, be gentle on me when those come up. So um, I won't bother asking those questions because I've actually already uh, asked people in the audience. So I'll try and explain a bit about what Bitcoin is first and then go into um, some more of the details around um, how changes are made to Bitcoin um, because it's a, a globally decentralized and distributed system. There you go. So, I've gone ahead too many oh. <laughs> Right. So, th this is my tech, as I said, I only wrote this a few minutes ago, so, um, so please bear with me. Um, so, Bitcoin are provably scarce digital assets, um, which we haven't ever had before, before the invention of Bitcoin. You couldn't prove that a digital asset was scarce and that you had the only copy of it, as it were. Um, they can be exchanged between users and the question a lot of people ask is, why do these things have any value? Um, because that's simply because people are willing to exchange their time, um, products or forms of money, um, US dollars or euro, what have you, for them. Um, so who owns what is not centrally held within Bitcoin. It's actually distributed among uh, a copy um, of it worth the ledger of who owns what is distributed among all users running Bitcoin software uh, around the globe um, on a, the software being called a network node. So what I said who owns um, what is, sorry, when I said who owns, um, why I put who in, um, air quotes is um, you don't actually tech, supposedly know who owns what you, within Bitcoin you can create what's called an address where people can send Bitcoin to and theoretically that can re um, remain anonymous and nobody can find out um, who that actually belongs to should you should you wish it's perhaps not as private as maybe the media make out and suggesting that criminals are using it and what have you it's actually a fairly terrible um, idea if you are trying to use Bitcoin for criminal activities because because the list of who owns what, as it were, is shared around the globe and it's publicly um, available, uh, if you, <laughs> uh, it's very possible that people can sort of track. Um, you, you know these ransomware things where people say uh, to unlock your computer you must send Bitcoin to this address? People could then monitor that address and um, track where those Bitcoin go. So it's not great for crime. I was expecting some people to get up and leave then. <laughs> no. So in order to add new entries to this ledger of who has what, without any central authority saying, oh, um, this guy owns that and that lady owns that, something called proof of work is used. Um, proof of work is basically, um, if you imagine a machine is sat there, um, I, I don't know how much detail to go into here, but essentially I'll try and explain how transactions work. Um, if I wanted to send some Bitcoin to yourself, um, I would broadcast a transaction, um, sending it from my address to your address, 
that would be broadcast around the entire network of Bitcoin nodes. They'd all validate that I indeed did hold those Bitcoin and I had the, um, the right to transfer them to you. Um, those transactions, in order to stop me from then trying to send the same Bitcoin to you and to you and cheat, cheat you all, um, before that transaction can be said as being confirmed, it needs to get added in what's called a block. And a block is basically a group of transactions that's added to this global database, as it were, that's shared with everybody around the world. So everybody has a copy of it on their local machine. So I broad, broadcast a transaction across the network saying I'm transferring ownership of these Bitcoin to you. Um, people, that, people called miners then operate uh, m machines which take these transactions and they perform something which is called hashing on them. I won't go into a huge amount of detail on that, but what it basically does is, <laughs> for want of a better phrase, it mangles up all the data in there and comes up with a, um, a long string of letters and numbers which is pretty much random in nature. And by changing the order of the transactions and a few other things, they can um, try to come up with a, um, an answer to that, as it were, which has a certain amount of zeros at the front. So if you took the word hello and you hashed it, it would come out as this long string and it might have zero at the beginning and then you might try adding something else to it and it would, might come out with two zeros at the beginning. And the, the more times you do that, the more likely you are to get more and more zeros at the front of it. And I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but um, I'll try and come, come back to that later. Um, and basically, if they found a solution to the problem, as it were, and there are millions of, um, or hundreds of thousands of these competing around the world to try and find the solution, um, about every 10 minutes on average, somebody finds a block solution and says, oh, I've got it. That gets broadcast to everybody. Everybody checks that that block is indeed valid and that gets added to my or your local copy of the blockchain and my transaction to you is now confirmed and done and I can't send it to you and I can't send it to you because it's already confirmed. And if I tried to, if I tried to broadcast another transaction sending, spending the same Bitcoin, it would be rejected, essentially. So this prevents what's called double spend. Um, so the person who found the reward, um, who found the block is rewarded and they're rewarded in Bitcoin. Um, that's the only way that new Bitcoin can be created, basically. Um, if I happen to be the lucky one who expended all this effort and electricity in finding this solution, um, I get rewarded with, at the moment, 12 and a half Bitcoin. Um, when it was first set up, the reward was 50 Bitcoin, but every four years, the amount that you get for, um, the reward you get for mining a block um, halves, so 50, uh, 25 and it's currently at 12 and a half. Um, following that, every 10 minutes, 50 blocks, and then after four years, um, every 10 minutes, 25 blocks, and what have you. If you trace that out over time, the maximum amount of Bitcoin that will ever be created is 21 million. Uh, so the key thing about Bitcoin is there's no central control over the monetary policy. Um, the amount of Bitcoin that are created, uh, validated by every node on the network and if somebody tries to cheat it and give themselves more than they're supposed to everybody else just rejects whatever work they've done ignores it and waits for somebody else to find one so it, one of the things it gets around is central central money control so obviously governments are in control of the monetary supply or rather banks are perhaps um, and they can create as much money as they perhaps want to um, whereas with bitcoin it's very fixed and hard in, in it was replicated. Uh, it, the reason why it's called mining is it very closely replicates um, the gold, the idea of gold mining. So there's not actually a fixed supply of gold in terms of how much they can take out each year. Um, but with Bitcoin, it, it is fixed, and that's one of the things we'll come to is looking at how it's fixed. So it's decentralized. It's censorship resistant. It's digital gold slash programmable money. Um, so one of the things you can do with Bitcoin now, instead of just sending you Bitcoin and waiting 10 minutes for it to confirm, um, there's a system built or a layer built on top of Bitcoin, which allows you to sort of stream money almost. I can make hundreds of thousands of payments every minute. Uh, so the idea that you could pay for Netflix um, instead of paying a monthly subscription, you just pay by the second that you're watching something. Or it'd be nice if you could get paid um, by the minute when you were working rather than paid every month, for example. Uh, as I say, it's not really very private yet. Um, it may be in the future people are looking to make changes to various things. Um, and it also touches a lot of discipline. So obviously there's a the technology aspect. 
which I probably did a bit of a mess of trying to explain earlier. There's also the social, political and econ um, aspects and also um, the economics behind it as well, which are all interesting. We'll cover some of those in a second. Um, so if, if this system's decentralized and I'm running a copy of it, and you are, and you are, and you are, um, how do you make a change to that software in order to add a new feature or something like that uh, if there isn't a central authority? So if we're all using Twitter or Facebook or what have you, if a new version comes out, your phone says there's a new version and they push out a new version to you and that's, if you want to use the new features, you get the new version. Um, with Bitcoin it's slightly different because there is no central authority. There's some developers who can propose changes in the software, but whether you decide to run them or not is entirely up to you. So, yeah, how do you make changes? <laughs> not very easily, really. Um, it requires uh, majority consensus from those participating. Um, we're, and we'll come on to what majority consensus actually means in a second. Uh, it leads to heated debates, um, a lot of salty arguments online, and is basically resolved by whatever software you decide to run and whatever software the majority of users decide to run. But as I said, we'll come to that in a second. So this is where my presentation actually started before half an hour ago. So <laughs> that was my intent to <laughs> briefly um, introduce what Bitcoin is. The key takeaway is it's decentralized. There's no central point of authority that's issuing the Bitcoin or saying um, who's got what Bitcoin, it's literally shared and distributed and everybody who runs a Bitcoin um, node, which is the Bitcoin software, on their machine is validating everything else out there that everybody else is doing. It's basically, uh, I think one of the phrases, I had it on a t-shirt I was going to wear tonight, it says don't trust, verify. So the idea that you shouldn't trust somebody else to be checking that nobody's inflating the supply, that your software can do that for you. and check it and it's a huge decentralized system that allows uh, the global exchange of value it's censorship resistant so theoretically nobody can sense nobody can stop me from sending i don't know i'm picking on you all the time you're the only person i can see because the bright lights um, so nobody can stop me from sending that money to it if i sent it to you and um, for some reason this chap decided that he he was a minor and he wasn't going to include that um, transaction in his block that chap there might do that lady there might do um, so eventually it would get through. So it's sort of censorship resistant and it crosses um, borders. So Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment algorithm, this is the thing that keeps the average time to find a block around the 10 minute mark, um, even if the hash power goes up or down. So remember I said earlier, there are machines out there that are trying to solve these um, problems to get rewarded in Bitcoin and to get transactions added to the blockchain, which is li literally, blockchain is just a list of it's a chain of blocks, um, which is like entries in a database, essentially. Um, so the problem with that idea was if you just keep adding and adding more machines that are trying to do this, they're gonna, somebody's going to find it quicker and quicker and quicker, and soon you'd be getting blocks every couple of seconds, and the amount of Bitcoin that were created would go through the roof. So it has something called the difficulty adjustment algorithm, which tries to keep it around the 10-minute mark on average. Um, it's quite frustrating to some new users of Bitcoin that if you send some Bitcoin, you might expect it to arrive instantly, um, which it doesn't. You might be aware that somebody's trying to send you Bitcoin, but it doesn't actually get into a block until, uh, it doesn't get confirmed as a transaction until somebody's found a block, and that may take, may take up to an hour. It, you may be lucky, it may happen in a couple of seconds. It's, complete, it's a sort of random um, process, um, the Poisson distribution, that means. Um, as to when that block is likely to be found. So it, 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 the difficulty adjustment algorithm tries to keep it around the 10 minute mark. Um, and it, so it tries to keep the supply steady, unlike other assets, um, for example, US dollars and euros, where somebody can push a button, type some things in at a bank on the keyboard and create a load more of it. Um, so it's more like gold than that. Uh, even gold can be mined quicker if its value goes up though, so they can the supply of it every day can go up if the value of it goes up, whereas if the value of Bitcoin goes up, there's nothing anybody can do to create more than, on average, um, 12 and a half every 10 minutes at the moment. So it, it, that's why the Bitcoin price flies around quite a lot, is the supply side has no flexibility, essentially. It's, it's a constant rate of um, emission. So, all right. so <laughs> miners are trying to find uh, a solution that meets a difficulty requirement. So this block was mined 
a few hours ago. And if you can imagine, um, basically, this, heat, this, this string here after the zeros, this is what comes out if you just put any random um, combination of transactions in. Um, if you juggle those around and add a few extras, um, what, what they're trying to do is come up with a solution that just randomly has um, the leading zeros at the beginning. Now, if you were to go, you can go on a website and type into a hash function, you can type random words in there, and you might end up getting one with a zero at the front, and you might sit there for half an hour and end up getting one with two zeros at the front. And the more, of, the more random text you put in there, the more likely you are that just by random chance you'll get one with three zeros or four zeros. So in order to get, I think that, yes, 18 leading zeros on there, an incredible amount of attempts have to be made in order to do that. Um, so the current difficulty, which means how many zeros you have to find at the beginning of the block, is 48 million terahashes per second. So that actually means 48 million trillion hashes per second, which is that number at the bottom. I don't even know, does anybody know what that is? It's got 18 zeros at the end. I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure what, what kind of number that is. Uh, so 48 with 18 zeros after it. So that's how many of those calculations, the random guesses I was talking about earlier, are happening every single um, second on the Bitcoin network. And in order to, to be able to carry out that many calculations, miners have to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on electricity and mining hardware. Um, and you may have heard that Bitcoin burns up the planet is a um, popular one at the moment, um, in, um, which um, people might say, um, because the amount of energy that's ha that has to be expended in order to um, carry out these calculations. Right, so Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment algorithm. Um, so you can only adjust after every 2016 blocks. I think that's a fairly arbitrary figure that was picked, but it's the one that was set in there and I don't think anybody's going to try and change it. Um, as you find a block every 10 minutes, that works out, 2016 blocks works out as about two weeks. So based upon the time taken to find the last 2016 blocks, let's say that miners have doubled the amount of machines that they've got trying to find solutions to the blocks. Um, the amount of time it takes on average to find one is going to come down from 10 to lower. So, after, so when it gets to the end of the difficulty period, 2016 blocks, the network decides, okay, this needs, to, this needs to now be harder, and it increases the difficulty, so it might be 19 zeros you need to find in order um, to get a block. So increase or decrease, because it does go down as well, in difficulty is limited by a certain factor, so it can't drop down a huge amount, only by a factor of four. So it, it aims to keep the next time, uh, the next difficulty period on average over those two, 2016 blocks, about two weeks. Um, and this is calculated by every Bitcoin client, not just by the miners. But if you are running a Bitcoin, the Bitcoin software at home as well, it knows that, okay, 2016 blocks have passed. It works out itself what the new difficulty should be on the network, and it makes sure that anybody who's creating blocks are conforming to the same rules that you are. So everybody at the same time all moves on to um, what the next difficulty should be and makes sure that everybody who's creating blocks is sticking to that difficulty validated by all. So this is how the um, difficulty's gone up. I didn't bother putting um, an axis on the side there, but you can see that it moves up in steps and then it actually st it started to move down and then back up again. So it moved, I think at the end of 2017, the price was quite favorable um, and a lot of Bitcoin miners probably put orders in for hardware, which were then delivered <laughs> and then the price went down. And now maybe they've started to switch a few of those off because it might not actually be profitable to run them, but it has started going up again. So that's the difficulty. So that's how many essentially leading zeros you need um, and how uh, to find to create a block. That's the hash rate, which is, remember I said the like 18 zeros or whatever it was at the end, which is also gone, it goes up and comes down sporadically, I guess, based on things like electricity price and this, that and the other. Um, but even though those have been going up and down, the average block time is still around the 10 minute mark. I say it's around the 10 minute mark because 
Um, if you switch a bunch of miners off, um, it's going to take longer on average. And if you turn the load more on, it's going to take less. But on average, it sticks around the 10 minute mark. And that's what keeps Bitcoin's um, inflation rate sort of steady. But well, you can put your hand up at any point, by the way, if you just then wrap it in on, you want to ask a question or something. I should have said that at the beginning. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, sorry, I should have said that ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, yeah. it could be probably possible that two miners at the same time find a block. Very good. So yeah. what happens uh, who gets decided who has the right block, who gets the reward for it? Yeah, that's very good. Um, so the question for the benefit of uh, those who didn't hear, the question was what happens if two miners find a block at the same time? Um, so what happens in that scenario? We'll divide the room in half there. Um, if, if, a miner find, if I find a block and I start broadcasting it um, to my network, uh, to people I'm connected on the network, it starts spreading out that way. And then this imaginary person here who also found a block and they um, broadcast it to you. At some point, you'll each have um, a copy of a slightly different blockchain. You've got my block at the end of yours and you've got this guy's block at the end of yours. So they're both tied as it were at that point. So you literally at that point do have um, a different history of the transaction record. So what then happens is I'm lucky enough that I find the next block. Um, I build on top of that and I broadcast it and that goes out across the network again. And this time when it gets to you lot, because this chain over here is now two blocks and this two block, sorry, one block longer than, than that chain, you basically discard the last block you had and you replace it um, with this slightly longer version. So you will get splits within the network every now and again, and they're resolved when one of the chains gets slightly longer than the other, and it wipes out the other, uh, discards the other, um, the other block, and everybody works on the longest um, worked on chain. Does that make any sense? Yeah. If, if it doesn't, it's because the way I've explained it, not because your I question. If I have a minor company, then I would um, not broadcast it immediately, I would wait and if I, if I know the answer to the block, you yeah. hit the right hash, and I know that um, if I find the next block, this will be my reward, then I would just not broadcast it immediately, but wait a bit and calculate the next hash. Yeah, the risk there is that in the time that you're withholding that block to try and work on another one, somebody else could broadcast. Yeah, but even then, I have a head start. You, you do have a head start. Let's say that somebody here broadcast. Um, so when I said earlier that I'd built on the other block that I'd built, the, the, of course, there'd be thousands of other people. And if they got the block that I'd built, they'd all start building on it. So it wouldn't just be yourself building on your own blocks. All of you that I'd broadcast the block to would then start building on top of that block. And all of you who had had the block broadcast here would start building on top of that. So it's whoever would get the next block. So if you were withholding one trying to build up a long chain that you throw out all at once, whilst you're doing that, other people are adding to the chain that's already out there, which may then become longer than yours, and you've just wasted potentially thousands of pounds of electricity trying to extend your secret version of the blockchain, as it were, rather than um, broadcasting it. So the network occasionally does diverge like this, perfectly normal for it to happen. Um, and in that sense, it's then out, out of consensus. So the transaction list is not accurate between the two chains, but as soon as somebody extends one of them, the, the other chain will just get its end replaced, as it were, by the most current. And everybody then agrees that is the most worked on chain, and that's what they carry on building on top of. Which is why if I did send um, you some Bitcoin, you normally would make, wait more than one block confirmation in order to then spend it, because it may be the another block comes out that didn't include my transaction and you don't get that Bitcoin anymore and then I can send it off to somebody else. So you, I think the recommended is you wait about six blocks, which sounds a long time because that could be, well, it could be much more than an hour, but on average it could be about an hour. Um, it depends, I guess, what you're buying. And there are other um, layers out there on the Bitcoin network that enable you to do immediate payments without having to wait for um, this 60 minute plus more or less period. Thank you for the question. Um, so one one effect of this of the fact that it's such a long um, period until the difficulty goes up or down is that basically within Bitcoin there's a sort of majority rules um, way of bringing about changes. So the super hard network difficulty at the moment. Um, it needs a lot of hash power in order to create blocks, which needs financial incentivizing. Um, the miners need to financially incentivizing um, by users buying and valuing that coin essentially. So let's say that at some point 
Um, I, I'll just briefly d describe what a hard fork is, assuming that some of you don't know. Um, it, there's a set of rules within Bitcoin, which are called the consensus rules, and they're things like um, how many Bitcoin you get for each block, how big the block should be, what the difficulty should be, and there's all these rules, and that's what gets validated when blocks are created. If I wanted to then um, change one of those rules and give myself more Bitcoin than I was due to get, um, I would essentially get separated off the network. Sorry. Oh no, I might have lost my sound. Sorry. Yeah, I might essentially get separated. Well, I would then get separated off the network because I, um, I violated some of the rules, but. Um, I might have a few people who also want to change the rule as well because we don't like the idea of the reward going down every four years and we might want to continue as it is at the moment or even give ourselves more Bitcoin. So when you split off the network in that way by changing um, a consensus rule, it's called a hard fork. Um, so were I to, let's say that you were all miners and I decided I'm going to split off and create my um, slightly amended version of Bitcoin. I would still have to meet the same difficulty requirements that you do in order to create a block. And with um, the number of you that are trying to create blocks, you're going to be doing it a lot quicker than I am. And any users who are using my version of that blockchain are going to be sat there quite a long time waiting for transactions to confirm. And they're probably going to leave it. Nobody's going to value it. And I'm going to end up having wasted quite a, a lot of electricity on something that's valueless. Yeah. Actually, the hash function also part of the consensus? Yeah, it or is. Could I change that? You could change it, yeah, but then it would quite explicitly be leaving the Bitcoin you network. Should, but after that, it's, it, this wouldn't uh, actually be possible because then I can uh, mine it with my own hash function. You could, so, yeah. So uh, the majority still couldn't compete with me because they need, wouldn't need other equipment, other mining stuff, you know? Uh, yeah, the thing is. So one of the things that the mining process does, it ensures that people can't censor transactions or undo transactions, basically. So if I sent you those Bitcoin earlier, um, six blocks later they're confirmed. In order for somebody to go back and rewrite a load of history so that that transaction didn't occur, um, if they're trying to censor the transactions or something, it would take a phenomenal amount of hash power to override that chain. Whereas if you split off on your own to create um, a slightly different version of Bitcoin with a super easy difficulty adjustment, um, uh, difficult, difficulty algorithm, um, anybody else could then jump on your um, network, as it were, and they could start running their software and they could um, censor all your transactions or what have you. And also, if you're within a group of people, um, you know, globally, worldwide, who are using the Bitcoin network, and then you decide to split off into your own network, who's going to buy, you know, who's going to value a coin used by one person compared to one that's used by millions. So um, this does sort of, it, it does pull everybody into using um, the same network, essentially. So any, so any minority, um, so anybody who supports a minority um, supported change are going to end up on a chain that doesn't have a lot of hash power, there aren't users who who value the security of it because there isn't a lot of it um, and potentially that will just stagnate and die unless you change um, the difficulty but then if you do you open yourself up to uh, attacks. They wouldn't change the difficulty, they would change the hashing algorithm, not the SHA-256, right. something else. It would be a, you would, uh, yeah okay, it would essentially be the same thing, yeah, yeah. but then you've created your own coin yeah, right. of which you're the only user and and it's prone to being attacked by other, by other groups. Um, okay, so, so it makes it very hard to leave, essentially, for the reasons um, we just discussed that. So it is like uh, gravity in that sense that it pulls everyone in. Um, people are also incentivized, oh, relevant slide. Um, people are also incentivized to stay with the majority. So um, being on the majority chain, means that you've got saleable values, the currency, there's less people you can trade between and they end up creating, um, yeah, at the end of this, they end up creating two other altcoins. So Segwit2x, um, this was something where, um, where the miners essentially, so remember I said that the people who operate like literally billions of dollars worth of mining equipment. 
said that, um, they got together with some businesses and said this is a change we're going to make again it was about the block size and um, we're going to double it um, at this point in time and basically you have no option because there's 90 percent of us that are behind this and a lot of major bitcoin businesses so you've got no choice we've literally got billions of dollars behind this there's nothing you can do about it they tried to make everybody change their software sort of out of fear um, so it was a minority of people really because although they had a lot of money there weren't a lot of them compared to the number of people who are running Bitcoin nodes around the world. So it was a bit of a play for control really. Um, they said it was a compromise deal to do with the people who I mentioned on the last slide. Um, as I said this argument about a simple block size went on for years. Um, but it, in the end um, and all the users are essentially, I won't go into the details of what the user accepted software was because it might be too long, too, um, too much to explain. But um, essentially all the users said, you can do what you like, but we're going to carry on running the software that we've got. Um, and if you do decide to go off and do your version, you take all your hardware and you start spending hundreds of thousands on electricity, we're not going to buy what you produce. We're just going to sit here waiting for people who want to actually earn money to come back um, and start mining Bitcoin again. Uh, so they actually, I think chicken down is a fair enough thing to say. Uh, they changed their minds before it happened, basically. So in that way, the sort of, yeah, the global presence and feedback of um, Bitcoin users all around the globe, just literally saying we're not changing the software that we're running. Um, you crack on if you want to, but you're going to be losing loads of money, whereas I can just sit here waiting. It doesn't matter to me if it takes a while for blocks to be produced, because I know that you'll be back because you want to earn money. You need to pay your electricity bills. Um, yeah, the, the global effort of all those users managed to overturn the efforts of some companies who had a serious amount of money behind them. So that was a really good positive for the decentralized network. I'll ignore that. Um, so what did these things show? Um, I didn't mention what that was basically, but um, if you don't provide users with a the feature they want, they can incentivize others to provide it for them. Um, if you try and force a feature on users they don't want, they can just reject the service you're providing, you're, you're wasting money whilst I sat there not wasting money. And if you can't get majority consensus, you just you can exit the network and create an altcoin, or you can uh, try and get majority consensus and people behind you, or you can just shrug your shoulders and say, okay, that didn't work then. So who is in control of Bitcoin then? Not the developers. Um, the thing that I didn't mention, now I regret not mentioning it um, <laughs> earlier. So not the developers, because I can, as a developer, I could um, contribute something and it doesn't matter. You guys have got to actually run it before that actually matters. Um, not the miners um, and not well-funded promoters. It's actually the normal users of Bitcoin that are spread out all around the world. Um, it's no one group entirely because everybody's incentives are sort of aligned, um, but it does it seems to have favoured the users um, in the last few uh, contentious moments we've had, as it were. Uh, so it's a balance of incentives, basically, between the network users, service providers and developers and in that loop that I was talking about earlier. Um, <laughs> so uh, wait, what was this talk about again? Um, so we entered this whole thing just by looking at uh, the difficulty adjustment algorithm. Um, so the very long retarget period in Bitcoin um, and the not very dynamic difficult adjustment is a key factor in this success. Um, without it, we'd see uh, frequent centralizing features of the user base and miners. We'd lose the benefits of being able to exchange with the largest number of other users with a common shared economic interest and majority rules. It basically pulls everyone into to working in one way. Otherwise, if you fall out, you're out of Bitcoin, essentially. So there's no better way that we know of to bring about changes on the decentralized, you know, global trust minimized financial system. So it may seem unfair um, that basically there's no compromise, but that unfortunately that's the way it is. There's no better way of doing it that we know of. Uh, and consensus itself, like agreement on what the rules are basically, is many layers, social and technical, um, and nodes try to enforce the properties of their owners, um, so the properties that their owners want to see as being Bitcoin, and the power of validating nodes is the power to reject the work of things that have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of electricity and cost a lot of money, 
the node you run at home can just say no to that and that's the power they have, the power to overrule and the power to reject people who are trying to change a system in the way that you don't want it. Um, and it's all a balance of interconnected economic incentives that create a network value feedback loop. Um, yeah, this is a good quote. This guy writes some good articles, uh, the one brand seven, probably not his real name. Um, Bitcoin is a system with many strict rules, but without any rulers. This is made possible because the rules are enforced by each and every user of the system. Changing the existing rules is nearly impossible, but new rules can be added if consensus is achieved. And the enforcement of rules without rulers may perhaps be the biggest innovation behind Bitcoin. So it doesn't really matter where you start when you're looking at um, Bitcoin because everything's interconnected. Wherever you start looking at it, you're going to end up finding out about everything in the end. Although the idea that you could understand all of it is perhaps a bit of a stretch. It's quite complicated and I don't think anybody claims to understand everything about it. Um, yeah. Any questions? Is there any, thank you very much. So glad. any questions, even if it's really general or what we're on about, or um, can you tell me again about something? Or? So I'm looking at you. Yes. Which country is better to mine the coin? Ah, it's very good. Um, just have a sip of this. Mm. That's it. So in the early days of Bitcoin mining, you could mine it at home on your home computer, basically. Um, and it, the value of Bitcoin wasn't very much at the time, so people could run it at home. As the value started to increase, people thought, oh, hang on a second, I could make some money out of this. And they would maybe then buy more computers or they'd start to mine it using specialized hardware at home. And as the value increased, and it, it sort of moved into being more of an industrial thing. So now they're literally warehouses full of Bitcoin miners, just racks and racks and racks of them. Um, now that started off centralizing a little bit in China, because I think in China they subsidized a lot of their electricity production. So it got to the point where it wasn't so much the cost of buying the mining equipment, it was all coming down to how, much, how cheap you could get the electricity for. Because there's somebody over there who's paying twice the amount you are, you, you can end up running more equipment, making more Bitcoin, selling them and paying your bills and what have you. So, but over time, it's got to the point where the electricity costs are, are so fundamental to being able to make a profit that people have been able to look for very cheap electricity and I guess there's no cheaper electricity than free electricity so at the moment there's a lot of Bitcoin miners who are setting up around like geothermal vents um, using solar or dam power and what have you and it's actually very interesting um, in the press you might read about Bitcoin being bad for the environment because the amount of electricity it uses but it's not as if electricity is a sort of finite um, resource. It's, I don't know how much electricity the sun kicks out every day, but I imagine it's quite a lot and it could more than serve our daily needs. So um, it's quite interesting that things like um, thermal vents and um, things like that, I mean, hydropower, they would actually be very expensive to connect to the electricity network and sell it into towns and houses and what have you. It is actually, you can make use of that electricity by, by literally plonking a Bitcoin mine next to, that electric, uh, next to that power source and using it to power your miners. So it's, I think it's encouraging people at the moment to look for free and renewable energy sources and to go to energy sources that are really remote and it wouldn't be financially viable to link them into the main network and actually extract value from them by literally using them to power Bitcoin miners and then sending the Bitcoin somewhere where somebody can, can sell it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. We can ask another one. If I didn't, if it didn't. No, no, I... Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah? Actually, I have a few questions. Yeah. One would be, um, do you think there is developing some kind of trust issue? Because, you know, there are full nodes and light nodes. I know you didn't explain yeah. it, but yeah. I think that the more we get to mass adoption, and the more yeah. normal users we get, yeah. the more light nodes we have, and yeah. the more they will have to trust the full nodes. I very much agree, yeah. Do you agree, think yeah. that will be a problem in the future? Because yeah. there will be some kind of centralization because of um, yeah. not enough full nodes. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, 
Will there be a problem if people are using more light nodes rather than full nodes? So I spoke about nodes earlier, which were doing the full validation of every transaction and block. But actually, if you've got a Bitcoin wallet on your phone, it's not. it hasn't got the full Bitcoin blockchain, which is like over 200 gigabytes and takes a lot of processing. You, you can run it on a phone. I think there's ABC, yeah, AB Core or something. Why, yeah, that's but... But, studios, um, yeah. That, um, way to think that they should smaller they should yeah. they, um, should smaller blocks yeah. so that everyone can um, yeah, to validate it. Yeah. So um so a light client would be uh, this is for everybody else's benefit, not yours. Um uh, a light client would be something a software that ran on your phone and it connected to somebody else's full node. So it said, Look, I'm trying to do this transaction, can you handle that for me? And it passes it off. And then it would inform you, oh, look, somebody sent you some Bitcoin. And your phone is doing nothing other than acting as a dumb turn terminal connected to that node. So, yeah, the risk there is that you've got hundreds of thousands of people all connecting to the node of one provider. Suddenly that person's got an awful lot of say on the network, as it were. So, yeah, I do think that that is a risk. Um, and in Bitcoin, it's very important to keep your the keys, the, the um, cryptography behind um how you actually store and own your Bitcoin. Um, people are focused very much on that, not your keys, not your um, Bitcoin. And people are saving on these hardware wallets. When you connect those in and they connect off to the node of the hardware wallet manufacturer, and it's actually, you can connect it to your own node, but it's rather complicated to do that. So, no, I do agree with you that the, the easier the solution, the better, but then there are solutions out there um, you can run it on your home laptop, of course, but people who get these like all-in-one box solutions that you plug in, like the Cats and Node and things like that, um, and other people working on software solutions, so all-in-one, so it's a bit less complicated. At the moment, to set it up, yeah, yeah it takes a bit of technical knowledge. Um, <laughs> then again, I set, <laughs> set my father's um, Amazon Fire Stick up the other day, and that wasn't an easy job. I literally think it would have been easier to set up a Bitcoin node, but... Um, uh, no, no, I, I, I share, uh, share that. If you go for mass adoption, people are just using it on their phone. You're handing a lot of power to the people who control the nodes those phones are connected to. So yeah, anything that can that can help um, more people to run the nodes and have a say in the network, I agree, is important. Yeah, can't see anybody in power though. So. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Any more questions, or did you have another? <laughs> has, has anybody else got another question? Yeah. Oh, you're just stretching? No, I'm Okay, so I'm I come to, back, yeah. I'm trying to phrase it. Um, how could you explain uh, what a hash exactly is? What a hash is? Yeah. Um, if I had my laptop connected to the internet, but I'm paranoid didn't earlier, <laughs> I, could, I could show you. Um, so, I ha can I turn that back on so that can go less bright? Is that okay? I will answer that. Um, so a hash, a hash function is, is a strange thing. If you put the letter A into a hash function, um, it will spit out, let's say, 128 random, they're not random characters, they're de derived from what you put in. Um, if you then add a full stop to the end, it will spit out a completely different string of 128 characters. And there's no way for anybody who's seen the two to know what you did that was different. Um, if I wrote the phrase, um, that red light over there is round, if I wrote that and hashed it, nobody here could guess what I'd entered in in order to get the output. But if I typed in that red light over there is round, it would come out exactly the same from a hash function um, every time. So it basically creates, um, I guess it um, matches, it creates unique outputs from unique inputs. Um, it's hard to explain without, yeah, but not to show it um, on the screen really. But if if you if, if you went online and looked for something that was called um, hash function and typed in A, then typed in B, then typed in C, and then just started typing random text in, um, and then went back and did the process again, you'd get the same answers. But if you typed a sentence in there, the chances of anybody else. And, and so if you typed a sentence in and then gave somebody the output, the chances of anybody else being able to guess what you typed in by trying it themselves and getting exactly the same output is like phenomenally small, so much so that it might as well be impossible. So what miners are doing, they're not, um, they're not, uh, they're basically feeding, diff they're, they're taking all the transactions 
um, and an extra number at the end. They're feeding that through the hash function. They're seeing just out of that apparently random text how many zeros at the beginning. Then they're changing one of the factors, putting it through again. How many zeros at the beginning? And it's literally just hit or miss. Um, but they're making 48 with 18 zeros at the end, hit or miss guesses in at what every second until one of them by chance just says, no way. If you put it in like this, you end up getting out um, 18 zeros at the beginning, which is um, what we're after. They can then send that to other people saying, this is what I did. I took the transactions and I added this random number onto the end of them. And then when you hash it, you get this, which satisfies the requirement. And everybody else can very quickly and easily, without any cost, well, very little cost, check that that's that that is indeed the fact. So it, it costs a phenomenal amount of energy in order to produce a valid um, block in Bitcoin, but it's very quick and easy to to validate it. My apologies if that didn't cover in detail. I really wish I'd connected to the internet now. I paranoid didn't earlier. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, I don't understand some attack vectors, so like maybe yeah. I can ask you about them. For example, let's say we have some crazy rich billionaire. Yeah. Let's call him Roger or something okay. like that. Yeah? Just randomly. Person, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, let's say he goes to like Amazon AWS yeah. and gets like, let's say we have like 10,000 Bitcoin pull notes. Yeah. 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 And he just rents the capacity to have 100,000, like 100 yeah. times this. Yeah. And then he's just like signaling the, um, some kind of rules that, that he just wants to have, you know, like mm. the consensus. So is there like some threshold? At the consensus level, where the rules would change. There's no, there's no such thing as, as signaling, really. If you if you just ran a full node and left it, it it's not doing very much, to be honest. Yeah, this full node could reject like everything else that's you, not with, with the rules yeah. that this full node wants. Um, it could well do, but it it's just sort of sat there on, on its own, if you know what I mean. Um, like if I set up a thousand full nodes over there. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't transacting through them. They're just what's called, you know, civil attack they machines. Have to, like, get the users they have to be actually used. Yeah. So you have to transact Bitcoin through them, and you have to accept Bitcoin through them. So if I was buying Bitcoin and it was being sent to my full node, the fact that I won't accept those unless it's the rules that I want. That's how I'm giving value to to the rules that I'm sticking to. If you just spun up a thousand machines over there and change the rule set on them they'd just be separate machines sat over there literally not doing very much at all. And, um, if I sent a transaction uh, to you that that they said, oh, that's not valid because we've got our own rule set, it just it gets rejected by them, but but so what? So yeah, this is called a civil attack, but um, like I said, there's no there's no vote. If if those machines had a say, if they if just their presence had a say, as it were, but it doesn't. It's what um, the people who run the nodes and what they're willing to accept as Bitcoin. You know, if I pay four thousand dollars for a Bitcoin and you send it me and it gets rejected because you've actually sent me some Bitcoin cash, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna be very happy with that. Um, so you're on a sort of separate network, as it were. So that's what. Um, um, I don't know why, why that um, annoys me so much when something goes on to screen say that. There we go. Nice, pic nice picture for you. Um, yeah, so does that answer your question? You, you can't do much by just spinning up nodes randomly. Yes. You have, to, yeah, I have to, uh, yeah, you have to use them and make sure that they're sticking to the rules that you... You have to get like, some special nodes with high activity on board, like a Coinbase full node, something like that, where they have a lot of users. Yeah, but also if... If, um, I mean, the exchanges in um, the Segwit2x thing, there was a lot of businesses behind that and they said they were going to change and yeah. people basically said, well, we're not going to accept that or because it's going to split the network, um, we'll just dump our coins. In fact, I think the thing that actually killed Segwit2x off was Bitfinex, who were one of the Bitcoin exchanges. I think it was Bitfinex, one of the Bitcoin exchanges opened up a futures trading market. Yeah. So you could trade the Bitcoin you would have if they did split off to create two networks. And the price of that got absolutely dumped on, and I think the miners thought, yeah, don't fancy spending an awful lot of money to end up not getting paid very much, so it was called off. And as it happened, there was a, a bug in the software anyway, which I think would have stalled, stalled the change they were going to make anyway, so it would have been funny if, it did, if they did try to do it, but they backed down before that. So I guess that was um, users sort of using the economic pressure before the actual event happened to, sort, to say, 
no, this isn't going to work out well for you, so they back down. Anybody else? Yeah? It, it, oh, that's a very controversial question. Um, it used to be exactly a megabyte that you could fit transactions um, within a block that size. Um, so, so essentially, so the, if I was a bit of a, um, if I was <laughs> trying to sell you the idea that we should in, increase these, um, the block size, blocks are one megabyte, you can fit a certain amount of transactions inside them basically. Um, if the transactions start to fill up the block, and um, let's say that each uh, each ten minute block was um, was one megabyte, but there were more people trying to fit transactions in than could fit in, what happens then is whoever paid the highest transaction fee would get included within the block. So, transaction fee is something that when you send a Bitcoin transaction, you include a um, an amount of Bitcoin that the miner can take as part of his reward is a reward for, for mining the block. So if you had a container that was just one, meg one megabyte in size and you tried to fit transactions in, and then basically there was more demand for space than there was space, people would start outbidding each other essentially. So this happened at the end of 2017. I think it ended up costing, because the price of Bitcoin had gone up, it ended up costing people like 30, 40, whatever dollars to, uh, to in transaction fees just to get included in the next block. So the very simple solution to that, the slightly um, sneaky way of selling um, an increase in the block size is to say, well, if the container's full, you just make the container bigger and then more fits in. It, and that seems obvious, really, doesn't it? But the problem with that approach is that it ign ignores an awful lot of the ways in which Bitcoin works. So if all of a sudden the blocks just kept getting bigger all the time and everybody's paying less fees, there's sort of two um, problems that come to the top of my head. Um, one of them is the fact that as the blocks get bigger, people who are running their nodes at home suddenly have an awful, uh, they have a lot more bandwidth, a lot more um, network traffic, they have a lot more to validate and it may well be, and because a Bitcoin node doesn't just receive the block and save it, it also passes on to many other nodes as well. So uh, mine at home like uses quite a few gig a week just downloading the blockchain and passing transactions around. So the larger the blocks get, the less people are actually going to end up running them, the less people can end up running running them. So this idea of a decentralized network where all the users can, can say no to the big companies who are trying to push changes down suddenly starts to weaken a lot when there's less people able um, to run these nodes. So. By saying just make the blocks bigger, it basically goes against one of the fundamental things um, that give Bitcoin value, which is its decentralized nature. It basically tends towards centralization, so you end up with a few companies that not only run all the mining hardware, but they also run all the nodes as well because they're shipping out 200 megabyte blocks or <laughs> whatever it is people want. Um, so then they end up completely in control of the network then, and to be honest, you might as well just use dollars or euros then because it's exactly the same situation that we've got at the moment and they could change whatever rules they like and you couldn't do much about it. Um, the other thing is that as I mentioned earlier, the reward per block halves all the time, so 50, 25, 12 and a half. Um, as that halves every four years, the original plan, and it's still assumed to be uh, valid I guess, is that in time, the transaction fees, um, as Bitcoin gets more popular, the transaction fees will, will go up enough to compensate the fact that there's less Bitcoin being rewarded in each block. So I think last year, I oh know 2017, I think there was um, a time when actually the reward from transactions was greater than the re reward for the block creation, um, as it were. Um, so that may, so that needs to be protected as well. So continually making the blocks bigger keeps the transaction fee so low that when the block reward keeps halving, who's going to end up paying, you know, the miners aren't going to be making enough profit to secure the network. So, does that make sense? <laughs> Okay, this was also the question I wanted to ask. Actually, I'm also some kind of Bitcoin maximalist, I guess, like you. But this is the biggest problem I see, and I also asked this to Giacomo Zucco. Um, do you think that we will have to implement some kind of 
static inflation because of the halving, because we, we force the Bitcoin price to go up. If it doesn't, we will lose security because the miners have to drop the hash rate because they can't pay for it anymore. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. So I think this is. It has to be a self fulfilling prophecy or we have some security issues. Yeah, so the question was do we need inflation in the future? Yeah, I would say. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, when I repeat the question, it's just for the benefit of the recording thing. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, the question was, do we, will we need an inflation in Bitcoin in the future? If you just keep halving the block reward all the time, um, does that mean that at some point in the future, miners aren't making enough to secure the network? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very good question, and I guess we won't know until we get there. And there are many things that may change between now and then. And the price, if the price doubles every four years, maybe we'll stay at the same level of security we got now. Is the level of security that we've got now enough? It, it may be. You know, maybe more than we need. Who knows? I mean, the the hash rate at the moment is insanely high, um, but it's also dropped from what it was previously. But people aren't running around panicking that there's not enough at the moment. So um, it'll be finding a balance, I guess, between do we think there's enough security and how much miners get um, rewarded for it. Um, and again, it may well be a discussion that comes up. Uh, personally, I think that the 21 million Bitcoin limit is probably one of the most hard, hardly defended um, consensus rules. So I think you'd have quite a job trying to convince people to change that. But if in the future there was the, it was getting possible that the security was low enough that attacks were imminent, then I'm fairly sure that you'd be able to change it. I mean, we can stay with the 21 million cap, but there are big coins that get burned. You know, we have like Satoshi's, 1 million yeah. coins. So maybe we can just make some kind of algorithm to calculate how many bitcoins are unspent and uh, do some inflation because yeah, of them, you know? yeah i think we you distribute them or something like that yeah i think there's um i do forget the name i think there's a coin out there that unless you unless you spend them you don't claim them yeah yeah something like that something like that yeah I'm not endorsing the idea, I'm just saying that the, the ideas are out there. And, and in a way, some of these altcoins can act as sort of test beds. Um, I mean, sorry, that might be a bit patronizing to some of the people who came up with them, but you know, if they're trying out different incentive models and Bitcoin's got and some of them prove to, to work, then I guess it's something that people can look forward to in the future. Okay. Can I ask another question? Because when you have some specialists about consensus algorithms, what do you think about something like proof of stake or delegated proof of stake? Do you think they are even possible to scale at the, like some effect vectors like the, um, like, you know, when you have Yeah. This, yeah. Like so the question was, what do you think about consensus what, what do you think? like Google Stake or delegated Google Stake? Yeah. Um, I think there's, the, there's a fundamental problem with those in that they sort of place the power with people who are already on the network, um, which I'm sort of a bit against the idea of. However, of course, you could say that in, in Bitcoin now it's hard to start up as a miner, I guess. Yeah. Um, I just think that the, the distributed, the way that Bitcoin works with proof of work seems to work <laughs> fine and proof of stake is not something I've looked into a huge amount to be honest only because I've seen it criticised quite competently <laughs> by other people. Um, I think yeah, any system can't obviously start off with proof of stake because how are you going to stake it in the first place but something like um, Ethereum I think the founder's reward was quite large so those people have then naturally got quite a big saying things and there's ways that it can be gained, I believe. So yeah, I, I'm not, I don't think it's so that we considered in Bitcoin. If, you know, if people consider a waste of energy, like I said, there's, you know, people are looking mm -hmm. environmentally um, sound ways to, to claim energy. Um, and you can say that it's not a waste of energy because it's given you a form of decentralized money and you could look at all the energy that gets wasted in various things. I don't want to ban Christmas trees, but <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you.